Hi, I'm John Groders. I'm just going to say it. Jeanette Wendell was the shortest author I met in the Christian Authors Network. But I'm not fooled. Jeanette's prose soars, and her nonfiction writing digs so deep into the facts that governments think she's receiving classified information. Meet this literary dynamo on today's No Shame. Have no shame. Welcome to the No Shame Podcast. I'm John Groders. My guest is Jeanette Wendell. We've been together about a day and a half, two days, and we've now bumped into each other three or four or five times. It's about time we really got to know each other because some of these things happen so quickly, and at a convention you meet so many people, and it can all start to muddle together in your brain. But um, Jeanette, I've got some information because you've got three main things that keep you busy. And, and we're going to talk about all three, but this is a very interesting life you lead. You uh, are married to the president of an organization called Global Mission, and that's a huge organization. You are uh, involved in training Christian writers all over the world, and you yourself are a multiply published author. Am I, am I close to co- converting the bases? You are very close, but the mission my husband is president is BCM International, and it is a global mission. Uh, works on 50, uh, 65 countries and five continents. All right. So I'd, one thing I can tell is that you are productive. I mean, you've got all these irons in the fire. Let's just talk about you. How, how, what makes you tick? How do you become so productive in so many ways? Well, it's actually very simple. I'm now an empty nester. Uh, my, uh, my life was far more family oriented and less productive when I had kids at home. I did <laughs> well, small projects, small publishing. Now that my children are out of the house, what else is there to do but be productive? Well, how do you do it? I mean, you, you've got uh, 23 books, you've, you're training uh, writers all over the world, you're here at these conferences, you're part of the uh, Christian Asso- uh, Authors Network. Um, what's your, like, how do you do it? What's your uh, routine? I actually uh, work uh, in car. I compartmentalize my life. Right. So the bottom line is when I'm on the road, like right now, I am thoroughly enjoying meeting people. I'm speaking. I'm preparing. I'm doing things. When I get home, I literally hide and work. And if I didn't have those two parts of my life where I can be at home and sometimes not see another human being for two weeks. My husband as a mission president will be in another country and I'm only productive because human beings are not entering my life. So basically I'm productive when there's no humans. I'm enjoying humans when I'm out of the house and speaking at conferences. <laughs> well, I think the humans that might listen to our little podcast should, should meet you. And you're meetable because Jeanette, you've published so many different books, works of fiction and works of nonfiction, and now even another sort of thing, which is you're taking feature films, which didn't have a novel originally, is that right, which were written as screenplays, and you're turning them into full-length novels, is that right? Yeah, I'm actually doing the nonfiction, and it's uh, a little bit more at the journalism side. Okay, I see. Where there will be a true life story, like the Amish school shooting, like the All Saints, the Chilean Minor... Uh, rescue of 2010, they are producing a somewhat fictionalized telescoped movie about those events, and then they will contract me to actually write the full true story that is simply too big to put into a movie. So I research, interview, write, and then I write the true story that tells the bigger story about which the movie does a shorter version. Which is quite fun if you enjoyed the movie. Like when you see a film and you go, that was an amazing story, but the movie's over, you can extend the experience for people, take them deeper. Exactly. And All Saints is a great uh, example. The Sony Affirm movie All Saints filmed just south of here in Smyrna. Because the movie is a great movie about what happened in this dying Tennessee church and this group of Burmese war refugees. 
but the movie doesn't really tell anything about the incredible stories of the war refugees themselves, the background of these people in the church. And I had the wonderful privilege of getting to weave together stories that are far bigger even than those that made the screen. So if you've enjoyed the movie, you can go and see what are the true stories behind these incredible people. Wow. You know, meeting some of you writers this week, there's a few here from the Can Network, and I've got a chance to meet a number of you. And I'll tell you this, an, when I interview an actor, what you see is what you get. I mean, that actor puts it right on the microphone, and you're like, oh, he's got the big voice, or they've got the big personality. When you interview a director, you can kind of... Authors, you're mysteries if we aren't reading your pages. So I just want to read some of this. Jeanette Wendell has won the ECPA Christian Book Award, the Christie Award, the Carol Award, the Golden Scroll Novel of the Year Award, CBS Bestseller List. She's in four languages. Uh, I mean, you, you've won a lot of awards. Now, I don't have all your books open to me, but I just, and you're not going to probably brag, but I think you're really good at what you do. <laughs> you I wouldn't... am a good writer, and uh, I, I, can, I can say that honestly. Of all the things in my life, I love writing. I've learned my craft. And I've had the wonderful privilege of writing some pretty good books. See, that's what I'm talking about. And the only way you readers or listeners are going to know that is if you look her up and you open a book and she becomes one of your favorite authors. Because I have my favorite authors, Jeanette, and they are like my best friends. When a new book comes out from one of these authors that I have spent time with and read everything they've ever written, I can't wait to go to bed that night and start reading. Because those little time in my day, which is the last moments before I fall asleep, is when I get to be with my, you know, Daniel Silva or whoever it might be, the new Grisham. I mean, I'm not saying they're the deepest, most spiritual books of the world, but these guys have become my friends. We've spent a lot of time together, me and my favorite authors. People that read your books, what is it? There's a mind meld going on. It's pretty deep. I have to agree because that's the kind of reader I am. I don't go to sleep at night without reading at least a little, and it's a Tom Clancy, John Grisham, Frederick Forsythe, all of the great sci-fi, and uh, that is really, I read great books, and that led me to writing the type of international suspense, if they call it the, the, the Christian Tom Clancy. Wow. Um, and uh, I hope people will stay up at night. I had one letter from a husband who actually told me, somewhat jokingly, that I almost caused a divorce in his household because his wife would stay up all night reading my books and he couldn't, she couldn't, he couldn't get her to go to bed. So. Well, they shouldn't divorce over that. I do think she should go to the iPad, though, because at least she can turn the light out that way and uh, you can read on the iPad. All right, so I, we have a little bit in common here, Jeanette, and I, I mean, I love Tom Clancy. I mean, I go all the way back to The Hunt for Red October, which was this magnificent tense psychological battle between these submarine captains from the American and the Soviet side. And then I was looking forward to the movie because I'm a movie maker and it wasn't a bad movie, but the movie could not do what the book could do, in my that, opinion. That is right. And that's actually why I write the nonfiction I do with movies, because the movie just doesn't have the time frame to do what books can do. And yes, I agree. I actually just reread through the Tom Clancy series again since they're now out in bargained uh, ebooks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, this is why I read the book and not the movie. Yeah, and I'm, it, it pains me to say that, but I'm, a, I'm an author. I'm not an author as prolific as, as you, but I've got three published, and I am, uh, so I'm not much of an author, but I do like to write. And I know I can do different things on the page than I can do on the screen. And I try, I'm trying not to pretend that a movie on the screen is going to actually capture the great novel because I'm so often disappointed when the novel is really great, often the movie can't work. The movie's got to be a different thing. My advice is always to read the great book first and then enjoy the movie. Don't ever do it the other way around. Well, that's good advice. I mean, just to take you down the road, I remember the book Prince of Tides by Pat Conroy. Did you yes, ever read Pat Conroy? I certainly did. I read, my, my mother was an English teacher at college. My aunt was an English teacher of college. And they had to, you know, read The Falcon and all that. And I remember calling my aunt, this is a long time ago, Pat Conroy, Prince of Tides, but I'm like, she lives in Seattle. And I just read this book. You tell me why this isn't one of the great American novels of all time. Because I think, you know, blah, blah, blah. And she talked to me about it. Well, the, I was waiting like crazy for the movie to come out. And it came out. And 
I, I hate to be critical of other movies, but it wasn't anywhere close to the Pat Conroy, you know, powerhouse that that novel was, in my opinion. And I was like, ugh. I was, I was falsely, I had false expectations. The good news for us book writers is there is still room for great books along with great movies. There are. And there are some great movies. That, I'm really having fun talking. I, I, did you read Amar Toll's book, A Gentleman in Moscow? Yes. Can we talk about it? Um, it's been a long time, so you'll have to remind it's me of the It's been a while details. for me, too, but I thought... Uh, this is, hasn't been made into a movie, as far as I know. And if any, by any chance, I could ever make the movie. But Amar Toll's book, A Gentleman in Moscow... And it's been a while since I've read it, but I thought it was the best book I'd read in a long time. It's about a Russian oligarch who, during the uh, Bolshevik Revolution becomes squeezed down as the as the country has changed over from being run by the czars to being run by the Bolsheviks. And many of the czars were killed or executed or imprisoned or exiled. But, but this count, I can't think of his name now, was this erudite, pleasant character who was educated and delightful. He was delightful in his education. Then he was appreciative of the finer things in life and could articulate his appreciation for fine wine or furniture or art or persons. But he was basically uh, sentenced to live and be imprisoned in the Moscow Hotel. And that was fine with him. He had a lovely life in the Moscow Hotel. And then they found out his room was too big. And now he was put basically in a closet. And, and little by little, everything started to squeeze in. All the joy of life. The communists just stamp it out to the point where he was such a wine lover. And they thought it was snobby for people to want like one wine more than another. And this... The wine cellar was rich with 100-year-old vintages, and the, the communists ordered all the labels to be torn off all the wine so you could order red or white. That's what I remember in a nutshell about a gentleman in Moscow. Yes. Do you want my response to I that? I do. I have never talked to anybody about it. Well, the funny part is, uh, because I have spent my life, I grew up in the, the uh, guerrilla zones of the Amazon, uh, spent my life in Bolivia and then all around the world with the poorest of the poor. Um, I actually, when I read that, and it just shows how different cultures, well, I enjoyed the book. Okay. But I also looked through it with those different lenses, which was that this, you know, aristocrat class, right down to getting to be imprisoned in a nice hotel, the reason they were overthrown was because, of course, most of the Russian people were starving to death and freezing in these winters while the czars and their class lived in this incredible, the highest luxury any aristocracy of Europe had ever known. And so reading that from that background, I think I was in Bolivia at the time, it was a little bit of, this is a good book, I'm enjoying the story, but boy, I can sure see where you kind of earned your... Yeah. You know, ending up in this position because for the last several hundred years, this is, you know, they, they didn't get to be in prison in a nice hotel. They're freezing in a hovel in a Russian winter. So it is kind of interesting how you look at the same uh, great stories and enjoy the same great stories, but you kind of have a different takeaway depending on your own life experiences globally. It is fun to talk about books with you. Have you read uh, Tolstoy? I mean, since oh, we're talking yes. Russia, so yes. you read Anna Karenina, it's sort of the same world, and it's from another side of the tracks, in a sense. Yes, and it was interesting because I grew up, you know, I mentioned in Colombia, went to a missionary kids boarding school. We had an outstanding education, which is why I became a good writer. But we had no television, no... The first... I was an adult before I ever saw a movie... But by the time we were in middle school, we were reading books like War and Peace and Anna Karina and, and these huge books. And it is kind of interesting that my literary life was shaped by being in the middle of the Amazon jungles and in the Andes and yet reading these thousand page tomes, you know, by the time I was 12, 13, 14 years old. And at that time, I thought that was the normal book for people to read. So it's been interesting looking at the new millennial generation that will think that a 30,000 word book is long mm -hmm. um, compared to what we did grow up in. Mm. Well, we've talked Tom Clancy, we've talked Tolstoy. Uh, would you, who are some of your favorite authors, classical or contemporary? Uh, well, Kain Potok has always been one of my They great... call me Asher Lev. Yeah, the, the, 
the chosen and the promise. Kind Potok is literally the reason I became the author that I am today. And uh, he was a Jewish author who became a bestseller writing about his background in you know World War II, uh, New York Jewish community. And the thing that impressed me, I read him probably the first time 12, 13 years old, was that here is this person who is a bestseller in the secular world, and yet his book drips with his love of, of uh, Yahweh, of God, and his love of Torah. And as I became a, an adult and began writing, the first thing I would always see is, well, we need to kind of think crossover. You can't really reach the world unless you kind of hide your faith. And I thought, uh, and of course, I'm in the middle of the counter-narcotics war of Bolivia, the guerrilla zones. I had these great Tom Clancy stories. And my thought was, if Kaim Potok is reaching people as he is, and he is not one whit as a secular writer hiding his Jewish faith, then why can't I write a book that's as deep and rich as a Tom Clancy, but has my... Uh, worldview of a God of the universe who, despite all of the chaos of our world, is sovereign and holds us in his hands. And it was interesting when that book came out, because if you read my books, there are no church scenes, conversion scenes in a youth group. You are more likely to be coming face to face with God, running through a jungle with some gorillas at your back with AK-47s and, you know, on. And so it, I wrote a book that my first readers were DEA agents, counter-narcotics, people who were not Christian at all, and yet they loved the book. And, I, and that just became my brand. I thought, I'm a Christian. I don't have to hide my faith in the God of the universe if Kaim Potok can become a world famous and not hide his. You're listening to, listening to Jeanette Wendell, author, and uh, here's what one U.S. Black Army Beret said of you, Jeanette. Jeanette and she, he says, Jeanette Wendell is the kind of storyteller other writers want to be when they grow up. It's fiction, but barely. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Black Army Beret uh, task force, you know, Fox correspondent saying that. Yes. Sounds like a man's man. Oh, yes. Chuck Colton, the uh, Fox War correspondent, he actually sent me a, a note because I was coming here and talking about these movies, and uh, I didn't know where he was because I'd written him and mentioned I was going to be here, and he writes back, and he's literally on the front lines in Syria in the middle. He was doing his third run pulling uh, wounded out over the lines in the middle of the fighting there with the Turkish and the Kurds. And I thought, yep, he never changes. Wow. Also a very good author. Here's what Willard Dickerson, uh, a former director of education, says. He says, Wendell's fiction is so convincing, one hopes desperately her fiction can't become the truth. You must write some pretty scary things. I tell, I write the truth in the places we've been. And again, uh, if I did not know myself that the God of the universe is ultimately sovereign responsible for our safety more than any government and has us in his hands, I would be scared to write the books I write, much hmm. less to, to read them. Hmm. When you're in the midst of writing, how deep are you? Um, deep enough that uh, I'm very happy to now be an empty nester. Hmm. Because mm -hmm. I, I always divide my life, again, uh, mentally, if I have to do small projects like write an article or prepare a workshop, those are the kinds of things that people can be interrupting my life. Right. When I am truly into one of these type of books, I have to get completely away so that, that everything else in the world is shut out. Mm -hmm. And sometimes two weeks at a time where I don't see another human and I'm living and breathing the place on the planet that I'm writing about. Do you write from home? Do you write from the road? Where do you go? Um, I write uh, wherever, and of course our home has been all over the planet. Um, I travel when I, most of my books have been birthed out of places that I've been. So for example, my Afghanistan titles, Veiled Freedom and Freedom Stand, which are both ECPA, Christian Book Award, Carol Award, uh, Christie Award. I was in Afghanistan doing the research on the ground, 
but then I would come home and, and we, I, we had the fortune, since my husband is a mission president, we have a lot of camps, mm-hmm. to be able to, in the middle of winter, hole up in the nurse's cabin in the middle of 100 acres of one of our camps in the Poconos Mountains in Pennsylvania. Mm. Do you play music? Do you light a candle? Do you have any rituals? No, I like absolute silence, and there's actually a very simple reason for that. I grew up and started writing in the jungles where there was no non-God-made music. Mm. And so um, I got used to the wind, the birds, anything that's there in nature doesn't bother me. But because I was never around constantly hearing music, and it's, um, I don't, I don't want any noise at all except what's natural to write. What's playing in your mind. Here's a book of yours called Congo Dawn. And here's what this uh, descriptor says. If absolute power breeds absolute corruption, what happens when a multinational corporation with unlimited funds hires on a private military company with unbridled power, especially in a Congolese rainforest where governmental accountability is only too cheaply for sale and is the ultimate conflict mineral mineral is up for grabs. Uh, You've got us in the Congo. You've got some big power money people that can't be pushed around and have no conscience. You've probably put us down in a deep hole where you can barely get us out. That's true. And that book actually was kind of birthed out of the fact that when I was in Afghanistan and Colombia and other places, I had been watching this birth of a whole new industry that kind of went back to the 1800s where suddenly you have people with no accountability who were unemployed uh, military, you know, veterans a few years before, suddenly running these multi-trillion dollar companies, mostly American taxpayer money. And as we have all watched in the news over the last 15 years, zero accountability. And I realized because most of them have moved out of America and are places like Dubai doing their own thing, Anybody with enough money can hire these gov- these armies. And I thought, you know, what happens when there is no accountability? We're clear back to the colonial era when the colonial powers were hiring these type of mercenaries to do their own thing. And hmm. that kind of birthed that book. And, of course, everything it's based on in the eastern Aturi rainforest has actually really happened. We have a foster, refugee foster daughter from the Congo who's ran for her lives and her village was shot and torched and burned and family killed and she lives with with my daughter. This is what Bruce Wilkinson, you know Bruce Wilkinson from, well, a pair of Jabez, crossing Switchblade. Uh, Jeanette Wendell's Congo Dawn, Bruce says, brings home the profound truth that God's love and human suffering are not impossible contradictions, but a divine paradox those refined in the fires of adversity are best equipped to understand suffering is used by God to test his body. It's in the Bible everywhere you look. Yes. That must make it into your pages. Yes, and that is the actual. I, all of my books have both the Tom Clancy mystery suspense, but also, and I always know when God puts me through something, some, you know, anywhere on the planet, there's a book bubbling because it's by the time God takes me through the fires, it's like that's the theme. And that was definitely the spiritual theme of Congo Dawn is that whole oxymoron of how can God's love and human suffering exist and coming to the conclusion that they do coexist because in God's, uh, in God's wisdom, which is very different from us, they aren't opposites. They are a paradox that are part of his plan and how he, he, as you said, tests human people and refines his church. Did you ever read any Wilbur Smith? Uh, Give me some names. The Eye of the Tiger. Oh, yes. I mean, it's African, and I'm I'm sort of hearing a little Wilbur Smith in Congo Dawn. It's just echoing for me. And by the way, Frederick Forsyth is another great author that I love. You know, the the Day of the Jackal... Uh, the Devil's Alternative, you know, all of those. Uh, all right, that's a good suggestion. I've never read him for no reason. I just never accidentally did. He is one of the great, along with Leon Uris and Frederick Forsythe, were two of the great 
uh, authors before Tom Clancy came along that you read their books and you understood what was happening around the world, whether it was World War II, the Cold War, the independence of Israel, and of course that was the time period they were writing was back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. But a lot of their books became movies, and believe me, they are nowhere near as deep. If you still want to understand that part of history, right, right. you know, pick up Frederick Forsyth, uh, Leon Mears. So you've traveled your whole life. You, 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 I've, we've got to travel, and I think that's one of the reasons I love authors who bring me to places either that I am or that I've been. One of my current kind of guilty pleasures is Daniel Silva. Have you ever read any of Daniel Silva's? Yes. Uh, Gabriel Elon, and it's Israel, yes. and it's, uh, but, but it's just because I've been to these places, and his hero uh, is an art restorer, so you get some great art, and you get some international, but these people, like I said, they're like my secret friends, you know, Daniel Silva and I, we, we get along great. I have to admit that is my type of reading, because I love uh, books that either teach me more that I didn't know about places on the planet, or take me authentically so I recognize it places where I've been on the planet, and give me a good story at the same time. Man, me too. I remember authors, my grandfather, my grandfather and my grandmother on my mother's side were voracious readers. I mean, he would read a book a day, and uh, and he got, his house was so full of books, they just you know, gave them away by the thousands. Some of these writers, I just like talking. You ever read Dick Francis? I have read every Dick Francis and every Alistair MacLean. Oh, beautiful. Those are two of the great British uh, classic writers, and uh, yeah, um, Going back to the fact that I am a missionary kid and grew up at a missionary kid's boarding school, there were standards as far as decency and language for authors. Yep. And uh, our boarding school was as much British as American-based education. So all of the classic British, especially, who were clean enough for missionary kids to read were on our shelves. So we read all the Dick Francis, all the, the Alistair MacLean, the Mary Stewart, the Dorothy Sayers, the Agatha Christie, the, you know, and of course all of the kids' classics. Uh, we had a thoroughly British literary education. Well, it's this is great. We did not set any of this up, but um, I've just recently been re- rereading all the Dick Francis books. And I just am in love with him. He is a fantastic writer, and he is clean, but it's so exciting. And every book has something to do with the world of horse racing, which I know nothing about. But after reading all his books, I almost feel like I could be a jockey. Exactly. And then each one has another. He pulls in things like glass blowing and international uh, uh, photography, international finance. I just uh, reread. The reason I've been rereading them is because, once again, I'm cheap. They've been coming out as dollar ninety nine bargains on Kindle, but the Sid Haley series is probably one of his his most classic. Um, but yeah, I've probably read because I read about one a night as well. I think I've probably read twenty of the old Dick Francis in the past year as they've come available. Well, Jeanette, who knew we had so many common friends? Yep. You know, and I think that's really fun. And the fact that we also have a common faith and that you are doing with books, what I'm also trying to do with movies, is tell the stories just as well as Tom Clancy or as Dick Francis or as anybody, and yet also never to be afraid of the, the powerful reality of the world, of the, the spirit in the world, and how it's changed people, motivated people, defined people. When you ignore that or when you completely sort of avoid it for fear that you've actually done yourself a disservice in characterization in my opinion so to put it in naturally which sounds like is how you handle it in your books yes sounds great to me yes and that goes back to the fact that it's true we do live in a very scary dangerous world with a lot of dark corners but we also have a great, loving, sovereign, all-powerful God. And that's the juxtaposition that makes my life make sense and that makes my books make sense. All right. Well, you better be reading some of Jeanette's books out there if you're listening to this podcast. you got to be reading, even if it's just a little bit. It's not a chore. You're not getting an assignment from your 10th grade teacher making you read The Sound and the Fury, and it makes no sense. That's not what we're doing anymore. We're reading because it's fun. It helps, you, it helps your day be more interesting. And you can find her stuff, if this is right, www.JeanetteWindle.com. That's J-E-A-N-E-T-T-E. 
W I N D L E, JeanetteWindle.com. Is that still the place to go? Yes, it is. Or just put my name into the Google and it'll pop up. Mm. Well, Jeanette, thank you for joining us on the podcast. God bless you in your writing and your fiction, your nonfiction, your movie scripts, your travel, your running missionaries, your training people, all the stuff you do. Thank you for what you've contributed. It has been my pleasure and thank you for having me. Awesome. No shame. No Shame is a weekly podcast where John Groders discusses life at the intersection of faith and culture with all kinds of interesting and inspiring guests. Subscribe to the podcast today by going to johngroders.com, select the podcast tab, and hit subscribe. Listen whenever you have time, but don't miss any of these life-giving conversations.